So, yeah, I think today again it was an amazing day. Um, made me think, I guess, think about a uh, lot of things. And what I will try to do now is so I'm, I'm going to um, bring us uh, back to the, the talks that we heard this morning. But I also would like to try to bring back the discussion with, uh, those uh, people that uh, work on, on different fields and from which we've heard uh, in the previous days. So um, why do we have a session about uh, development and education? Why is that interesting? And maybe that uh, for some of you it seems like a weird question because we want to understand development and education. We um, want to understand why kids fail at certain things and how to teach better. So uh, we basically take this kind of approach that there are some theories in the field and some methods and then we want to see how do they fare in situations in which there's little memory, for example, so that would be development, in situations in which there's a lot of distraction and that would be education. Um, and also we, we haven't talked about developmental disorders, but that could be another case. So how would they, uh, these theories about curiosity and information seeking work when there's little social interest, for example. Uh, but um, just this, uh, uh, going back to uh, um, a point that was discussed, I think, after uh, Pierre Yves' um, intervention, this, where do we put theories and where do we put experiments? So is this, do we need to have this uh, top-down approach when we think about development? Uh, or is there, uh, can we see development and education and um, a type of population as experiments that you can do and maybe refine the theories themselves and, and the methods. So I'm going to go through the talks and try to see if there is something that we can learn, not just for development, but about the theories themselves. So Katarina's uh, talk uh, uh, so she told us that we learn from others and that uh, uh, babies are very good at knowing who is a good teacher and that may even explain things like uh, uh, group preferences and we sort of point to this better memory. And I have to say that uh, um, knowing how uh, um, good uh, uh, others are at uh, conveying information makes me really wonder about uh, uh, why uh, infants ever do anything else but use others when they are available. So this takes us back to the theories on um, and what drives uh, information seeking and it, if, if it's learning progress. Well, there may be some bad teachers around, but most people will be good teachers. So why ever uh, appeal to anything else? Why ever explore? And then, of course, um, it may be that others are not good teachers in, in, in any case. So there are certain things that, of course, depend on others, like learning labels. Um, but maybe there are other kind of information that we cannot access uh, through, through elicitation from others. Uh, so, for example, if one thinks about tool manipulation, so exactly <laughs> one, the adult can tell you what the goal of interaction is, but not exactly how you can do it with your own body. So maybe there's a distinction between learning what versus learning how um, that, uh, that the infants use to know which uh, strategy to use. Uh, but this also, going back to the theories, um, makes me wonder whether there is not uh, something missing in this link between um, uh, your ability to, to measure how fast you learn um, and uh, the curiosity and maintaining motivation and which is the means. So you, uh, you will progress only if the means that allow you to do that learning process are available. And I'm wondering whether curiosity and even the, the phenomenological the experience of curiosity uh, takes into account this means, the avail availability of means in the environment. I mean, maybe there's something that is already uh, taken into account. And then more specifically um, about uh, these talks, I'm wondering what, how far can we go uh, with these ideas about uh, the fact that the infants are really hungry for information that makes them, uh, uh, might make them uh, split people into groups, begin groups depending on how well they convey information. 
Um, and can we take that farther and explain other things like musical preference or other biases that uh, the developmental literature is full of, like whole object bias, uh, based on information uh, seeking uh, or more preferences? I don't know. Um, and then going back to uh, Daphne's question about uh, the groups and this uh, uh, obvious fact that we that uh, infants can learn a second language, that they interact with, uh, with speakers of another language, so clearly these biases that uh, Katarina is talking about are not long-lasting. Um, so then I'm wondering, so they're not long-lasting, but then if you look at the developmental literature, it's quite a replicated finding that babies show this immediate uh, preference for native speakers that they dislike or don't interact with uh, foreign speakers. And then again, I'm wondering whether uh, we can use information to understand the transition between the two and maybe the study that she did on uh, function, uh, learning object function, uh, gives us a link. So maybe uh, if these like, foreign speakers offer learnable information like function, then they could be accepted and learned. Um, and yeah, I'm not going to go too far about uh, um, racism. <laughs> Uh, but um, one, can, one can think about maybe a way that decreases kind of ba uh, biases that would involve information. Uh, okay, so Louise, uh, the difference between not knowing and knowing one does not know, just thinking about that uh, makes me feel tired. Uh, and I think that's evidence that, that uh, uh, metacognition <laughs> is not uh, easy and we're not very good uh, at dealing with our knowledge and our thoughts. Um, so, so I had the impression that this is not necessarily a distinction that was made in the previous days, but then maybe that's a, that is because there is no distinction really. So as uh, someone was mentioning earlier, uh, uncertainty is part of the information representation. So the way we represent information, there is a, uh, um, like knowledge that uh, distribution, uh, one can calculate the standard deviation of that distribution, so uh, that's uh, uncertainty. But uh, it still remains the case that, that we're really bad at reflecting on that um, and uh, associating cues that we use to elicit information to that uh, perception or feeling of uncertainty. And, it remains the case that the words know and think are learned very late. So Louise showed us that infants as young as 12 months can uh, um, uh, adapt their behavior to their uh, knowledge levels, but it takes another year or more for children to actually use words like know um, in the appropriate context. So how do we explain why is it so hard? Why are these concepts so hard to, to learn? Um, and then, um, is, would there be any uh, advantage of be becoming better at this explicit access to, to our knowledge state? Um, and how would we do that? So how, how would you train someone to, to get better? And I think that goes back to understanding what exactly is the nature of the computation that is done that gives you uncertainty. Um, and then also thinking about, because this is, in, in education, this, in the explicit way is the way in which one uh, inquires about other people's knowledge. So you ask the class, what do you know this, do you understand this concept? And they're bad at doing that or uh, not, not very good at it. Uh, so maybe using these strategies to ask about knowledge uh, is the wrong approach um, and one should, uh, actually I don't even have a, a solution to what one should do there. Uh, so I have to say, I kind of struggled with, with, uh, with this um, topic. Um, Lisa's talk. So uh, we've, I guess the, the biggest news there is that one uh, infants can use core knowledge to start learning about the world. And, um, and this goes, goes back to this uh, issue about priors, models, or structures that uh, are being referred to in with different terms. Uh, so, what do you do if, surprisingly important for learning, what do you do with a creature that knows nothing? That, so, there's no way to create surprise. 
And Lisa has a solution, so we are born with some, uh, some knowledge, and so we can violate that. And um, I know some people in the audience would be really, really happy, because I think this is uh, probably one of the, the biggest issues that people in the AI field have, is that they want to put some prior knowledge in the models, but they know they're not really allowed to put too much, and now here is, there is something uh, available. But uh, I'm going to go back to Gert's uh, point, which I think is valid, and which is that core knowledge is not good for doing that, because core knowledge uh, is there to tell you what the world is, uh, so the world uh, will rarely be something else than what it is, right? So there won't be many opportunities uh, for using that kind of, um, of knowledge to learn about the world. And actually, it would be much better if core knowledge was not like the world to allow for more surprise, but then it wouldn't be, wouldn't have the same function. Um, but saying that, actually there are situations uh, in which we have these very strong biases, expectations, um, and that are wrong. And we had an example today with the books falling, so I know that a lot of people make really bad predictions about uh, um, yeah, the speed of uh, falling objects. I don't even know what, that, what the, <laughs> the problem is there, so why, do I, why would I make a, um, a wrong prediction there? Um, but there are other cases as well. I think there's something about the trajectory uh, of objects that move on the horizontal, <coughs> that people expect them to fall in a different way than they actually do. Uh, someone, Denis, is not here anymore. Maybe Gerd remembers the case. Um, so there are, there are some of these things, that, that these uh, um, expectations that one can actually use to learn about physics. So why... why uh, was the way things really uh, behave, um, but those are rare, um, but maybe, are, maybe they are actually also deriving from some core knowledge, so maybe, for example, the, um, the trajectory thing, if we expect a linear trajectory in, in that case, and maybe that goes, that uh, follows from our expectation of um, continuous motion, so maybe those cases still derive from core knowledge, um, I'm not sure. Anyhow, um, it doesn't matter. We can still make use of that, maybe, in classroom. So uh, maybe we should we can just uh, use uh, uh, the, the ability to produce magic now with the technology we have, and then use that in classroom to get kids interested in, uh, in sciences. We can uh, show bent spoons and make things go to walls. Um, but then we go back to the gen generalizability of this. So uh, there was a big debate about uh, how specific these effects are. So uh, it's not going to be enough to bend a spoon and then teach them about uh, our history. So there must be a, a relation probably between the, the surprise generation and the information that comes uh, afterwards. Um, and so more specifically, uh, um, I think this is a fascinating question. Uh, so what, what will we learn about in these situations? And so I was um, wondering, in the case in which there was that uh, uh, object uh, that uh, changed the properties, the, the blicket, let's call it, the change the property of the, the other object underneath it. Um, so in, in that case, children then are, are taught a label of the object that causes the property. So how important is understanding of the uh, uh, one of the other being uh, causal in this, uh, in this particular uh, event to decide what information is most interesting? So if you were to teach them a label for the object underneath, would they benefit from that? Or is it really about the, the, the agent uh, that they are requiring? Uh, and is that because of the hypothesis that they make in, in explaining the the surprise event. Um, hypothesis testing, so again, uh, uh, that's fascinating. And, uh, I, I'm really puzzled again by how we, how maybe started this. Um, so remember Carr's game about the, the dots, we all failed at it. I think also because the pointer was really bad. So we didn't really know what it was pointing to, but uh, so in that, in that case, uh, the solution was that uh, you had to take into account uh, the object to the right of an object, 
Um, so I mean, right and left are learned very, very hard, very late. I, we might not babies might not have access to that particular hypothesis, but I think Carves um, Carve believes that all hypotheses are there at, uh, at birth. So then, in any event, you have all the possible hypotheses that can be instantiated in the brain, and then uh, you just go through them and select uh, the right one. Then uh, um, the babies in Lisa's study, uh, what they do, which look like imitation to uh, to Jackie, um, so they they were trying to, in a way, to reproduce the the action that they they had seen being violated before, um, and although it's not, it's not fully imitation, I mean, it was very close to that. And but um, um, the way uh, Alison's uh, Alison's talk, I think, clarifies that uh, a little bit because uh, it, in that moment, their whole hypothesis was A and they had evidence for non-A. So they, they thought the object is going to not go through the, the wall and the object went through the wall. Uh, so that, there's probably a very strong prior for that hypothesis for A that remains and so maybe by uh, producing variations of A at that moment, uh, that's all they have to try to, to find out uh, what alternative options they are. Um, okay, so deafness, learning to learn. Um, so here we're, uh, we're going back to this question about levels of information and information is organized in hierarchies um, and uh, attending or seeking information at certain levels is actually going to be more useful than at other levels. Uh, and how do we figure out which level to go for? Uh, I, I, something that I don't know if it was uh, um, fully explored uh, today in the talk. Um, so in um, in the case of uh, uh, when participants had to, to discover um, that particular movement of the wolves, uh, so that they were crossing uh, in the trajectory. Um, so it's uh, a way to get to that level by rendering the, the lower level impossible to learn. Um, of course, one can learn that by explicitly being told that there are many levels, and I'm wondering if this is what education does, just telling, uh, uh, we learn that there can be explanations that happen at different levels without specifically learning about um, uh, what the levels are necessarily. Um, so, but working memory, so this is a bit of more random thoughts because it was uh, um, closer in the past. Um, why working memory is important is it because uh, one needs to maintain in, in memory different levels of explanations. Uh, there's even here some stuff that Katarina wrote while I was. Uh, so, uh, media, immediate satisfaction of curiosity. So, there was a uh, why is media uh, bad for, um, for discovering uh, these alternative levels? Um, and could be that it creates maybe a surprise overload. And uh, also, so something I was wondering uh, whether it was uh, measured uh, in the training effect, in the training study. So this was a the study in which participants uh, who have been, who have done a lot of um, video game, who have done video game training are much faster learning to discriminate the, the line orientations. I mean, is there just motivation? So we have seen um, in another talk that participants are very good at finding motivations to do very boring tasks, uh, especially if they're not external war. So is, it, is that something that these people are gaining and not particular uh, um, uh, transferable knowledge about what could be learned, but something much more general that is uh, just uh, the motivation to pursue in a very boring task. Um, and also, so in, in those tasks, um, because I, I really love this, this idea that there is transferable knowledge that can be um, taken from one task and to another, and that this is really what we have to teach. Uh, but I'm not uh, certain that 
what is that kind of uh, knowledge that could be um, of, uh, that could explain the effects in those particular line orientation uh, tasks. So uh, it is not thinking about the first experiment in which they learn that uh, the trajectory uh, is uh, that they don't have to go back to the same uh, locations and the trajectory crosses. It seems like there's a big gap between that and what they might be doing in this task. So that's why I was thinking about motivation. And uh, okay, so here is where I'm going to cheat. Um, I am often using Allison's uh, um, TED talks uh, for my lectures, uh, not only because of uh, the content, which is very interesting studies, but also because uh, she's uh, uh, a very um, enthusiastic uh, speaker. Um, and so this is something that uh, uh, we have not talked about, uh, um, but I think maybe in the education I think it is very relevant, and which is the importance of the, the interest and the, the uh, sort of motivation of the teacher itself. Um, and I'm wondering whether interest in others is something that is contagious. So is, is it something uh, that uh, uh, children can um, somehow take on? And I'm thinking that might be the case because in the end, um, it, if we uh, think about one of the current hypotheses that what matters is how much progress we make in learning, well, that is a subjective uh, judgment as well, how much learning, uh, uh, it's not necessarily an absolute in terms of the information in the world, but maybe what matters is actually the, your perception of how much uh, progress you make, so that, that could be changed uh, by the teacher, but maybe there's something else about a teacher that is um, very excited about, uh, about their topic and then I'm wondering how do you get excited about wanting to teach so we, we talked about uh, uh, being motivated by learning but how are you motivated to teach others which is uh, not really decreasing your uh, level of uncertainty or you don't really gain um, knowledge yourself and is it important to be an expert in that field to do that uh, yeah, so um, just a last thought, so that uh, I'm not fully cheating. Um, so I was wondering about this, uh, uh, again, going back to where do hypotheses come from and early on in infancy. Uh, and so I think that has been this idea that maybe it's partially what Axon was talking about, that well, infants um, move about and that are very energetic because that allows them to bump into interesting things and discover hypotheses. Uh, but I'm, I'm wondering whether that could work because one doesn't understand the question uh, answer if we don't know what the question was. Uh, so even in that sort of random explorative, explorative uh, approach, uh, one still has, has to test hypotheses in order to know what we have discovered. So I think we don't solve the issue of where the hypotheses come from. Uh, so we saw this uh, question a few times. What is curiosity? What can you tell us about what curiosity is? It is nothing because they do not have the word. They, uh, they cannot tell us if they're curious. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe finally, uh, by studying infants, we can focus on the important questions, not how they feel about uh, information seeking, but uh, um, how um, uh, what the mechanisms behind information seeking are, the raw rewards of uncertainty, of, uh, of novelty. Uh, education, um, do I have to say much about this? So, uh, I think it, so this is the first talk we had. Um, so, um, Derek was mentioning uh, teachers embracing a lot of uh, scientific hypotheses or theories before they are really proven. And a lot of these theories are intuitive, which may be a trap, and that's the case for researchers as well. I mean, think uh, mirror neurons, sounds good. Um, so, do we need to also need to think about how to promote critical thinking um, in, uh, in teachers? Um, and then, uh, 
Yeah, so the RCTs are difficult, so if we want to use uh, education as a testing ground for hypothesis, I think uh, teachers will have to say something against that. And I, I find that um, interesting and, and also difficult uh, to find a solution to it. But then I'm uh, going back to the beginning, I'm wondering whether in terms of education, uh, there's no val some value about doing this, and I know this will sound like heresy for um, for us scientists, um, but I'm not suggesting that we should forget about theories, but maybe there is some, um, some um, value of looking at what works and then taking those things from the education field and testing them more um, clearly in, in the lab, cycling, waiting. And that's what I have to say, <laughs> so I hope that Stimulated more questions. Or comments. We hope we other talk that I could have given that other people have shown is that some of the kind of narrowing that you get with age, you also get when you put children in a pedagogical situation. So the same way that, <laughs> that um, and there's actually some pretty nice evidence about it and lots of people have argued that it's rational, right? So if you have a teacher who's telling you something, it makes sense to narrow your hypothesis search to fit what the adult is teaching you. So Liz Bonowitz, who's done this work, talks about this double-edged sword of pedagogy. Um, where there might, it might be, the, and that might be part of the reason why you don't just want to rely on social sources of information. So you can see, again, this kind of trade-off where the social information gets you to a good, good solution, especially a good enough solution quickly, but you still want to do some exploration because the, the social situation is going to make you put, the, the social information is going to be narrow. Yes, but I'm, I'm maybe this no links to your, your idea about uh, environmental change and that we need to be prepared to come up with new solutions. Right. But are children those that that come up with the new solutions? I always wonder. So I don't know if, if that is a source of innovation in the end. In um, yeah. So society. I think I, I, obviously you think about this because the kids aren't the ones who are actually developing the new technologies, at least the preschoolers. But I do think there's an interesting possibility, which is that. If you, look at the, if you look at the history of technology, often the adults who are inventing the new technologies don't really know how they work at the time that they invent them. Mm -hmm. So they'll, as I say, it, it's amazing how often it's, you know, four guys in different labs who are tweaking something that they already have and something comes up that sort of makes sense, but nobody quite understands what the common principle is. And then the thought is that the new generation is looking for these big common principles and the things that they're seeing yeah, around them, yeah. that the adults themselves don't necessarily, the adults who are inventing the technologies don't know that the reason why the technology is working is because of some, hmm. some general new principle. I mean, I think so, it would be interesting to, to maybe look longitudinally if there's any relation between the more exploratory or less pedagogically inclined children turn out to be more innovative yeah. you know, uh, adults. And also, uh, I'm also thinking that uh, although most adults are good teachers, you also need to, to maintain some vigilance. So yeah. maybe t being able to test on your own remains important. Yeah. Sorry, it's probably a good discussion elsewhere, but what you just described is this tendency in science to rewrite how things were to discovered. And there was a lovely interview when the Hicks Boson was announced on television with one of the people who'd been leading it. And the, the interviewer said something like, and, you know, so how did we get to this? So doesn't science move incrementally? And this guy quite openly and honestly just said, no, it usually goes a big jump, we find somewhere, we then fill in the gaps, and then we retell the story. And we tell the story as though it was incremental. And in, in fact, sometimes we keep trying to do the incremental bit, and the big one gets, goes back to what um, you were saying about being able to see the things that are off piece, as it were. You see what's off piece, and then you work out how do we get from there to off piece? 
uh, and, and sometimes in education and in science, we miss that big one because we're still down here and we've got to stand back. Mm, yeah. Well, so I think almost a little bit like what I was saying before with this idea of you know, attention for learning and attention for action. I think we have to be, um, uh, to not think of a dichotomy of either or. So I think the, you know, creativity and innovation comes from precisely this ability to combine both modes of being. And I think that there's definitely a trade-off between a high temperature mode, which may be good for generating randomness and learning and it's not clear what it's good for, but certainly it could be good for some of these things. Um, and the highly focused mode, uh, which is clearly good for efficiency, uh, but maybe too narrow and inflexible and may miss other important things. Both modes of uh, being and going about the world are really important for us. And I think that the, the, the what's really um, uh, interesting to me is how we can combine them. So I think in the best examples of creativity and innovation in grown-ups, they are built on expertise. I mean, unless you have that very focused domain knowledge, you can't even generate the hypothesis. You can't even understand the significance of an observation, right? So you have to have that expertise while at the same time not being over-focused, uh, being open in some way, right? So that's really the question, how do we combine those two in, a, in the best way? Uh, actually, uh, what I was thinking of saying uh, complements, hopefully, what you, you just said. In defense of uh, Lisa Ferguson, I, I'm inclined to think about this, what is given and the surprise for learning new stuff uh, in a similar way that you described, probably, like what is given at birth, all this genetically determined stuff like perceiving objects as one thing rather than different parts and all that. That actually helps you learn all sorts of different things with what you can do with, the, with those objects and the causality and this and that. So it's a preparation to discover the world. But at the same time, if they fail to uh, predict the, the outcome, then you're further motivated to learn more probably. Is that a good thing? Thank you. <laughs> Just uh, to maybe one of the prime to make the link between uh, education, practical purposes, and the scientist is because we, uh, as scientists, there are some claims that we will not make because we are scientists. So, for example, making short shortcuts between uh, the activity in the ventral striatum and the pleasure, I will. It's very. A very bad idea for a cognitive scientist to make, to make such a reverse inference in front of his peers. But nonetheless, I think that this kind of uh, approximations, which uh, might be uh, useful to guide uh, education, because we know that on average, the reverse inference might be uh, more or less valid. And so um, maybe it's a matter of uh, which standard we use uh, in both fields to uh, discuss the effects that we try to show, uh, enfin, that we try to, to prove as effective. Like, uh, probably the ventral striatal activity to improve educational practice over thousands of uh, children, the mean effect, which is going to be the valid part of the reverse inference, may apply to all those children. There might be a good mean effect, even if at the local level of an experiment, we may say nothing about the meaning of a ventral striatal activity. So it, and uh, the second um, comment is about uh, thinking about ourselves as scientists, what drives our own curiosity. And uh, I think we have a lot of uh, tools to think about that, like wh why are we driven by knowledge ourselves? And um, I wonder whether one of the things which happen is that we constantly go out of conferences, talks, uh, studies with new questions, new unrelieved questions, while uh, the teacher tends to uh, answer all questions during a course. So he, as a teacher, you want to maximize the amount of knowledge you give to the children. So it seems very counterintuitive to 
not give, to open questions and not give the knowledge at the end to frustrate curiosity. Uh, but uh, I, yeah, I wonder whether uh, the fact of having questions and uh, the, the ignorance, the fact of really trying to trigger the ignorance state in uh, children may, might not be a way. So of course, it, there is, it limits knowledge transfer, but in the meantime, it makes knowledge uh, valuable uh, because knowledge then come to relieve a state of ignorance that you will never feel if you're constantly bombarded with uh, information. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that most of us would agree that that works as a, as a way of improving motivation. Now I'm wondering how, uh, how uncommon is in this idea in the education field because I have the feeling that sometimes uh, the ideas we come with are actually already old tricks. That, so it's good that we, we have evidence for them, but uh, then they it's not as if they haven't been there already. So I, I'm wondering uh, whether you know about this idea that you need to, to ask questions and uh, uh, rather than give information, have the, the student uh, first seek for the information. Sorry. I think if you talk to pretty well any teacher, they know the importance of answering, of asking questions. The, question, the thing is, what sort of questions do you ask? because they will depend on what you're trying to achieve. You know, I, I could give you, you know, a workshop on asking questions, because mm -hmm. some questions you want kids to focus in on something. You know, what do you notice there? Because you, you understand that noticing that thing will help mm -hmm. move them forward. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll say, what would happen if, which is a much more open question, and it's getting that balance right between, it's the same questions you ask as a scientist, and it's, it's what, uh, we've been said here about it's getting that balance right between the wide open stuff and the closing down stuff and, and one of the, the, the things within teaching that I find sometimes people say ask open questions that's good don't ask closed questions you try that I, I think first noticed it working with children who've got learning difficulties you ask an open question they go <laughs> Sorry, that yeah. just is the expression they use. You know, but so you say, well, actually, can you tell me what colour that is? And they'll give you a response. And you then know to either ask a question to reinforce that, or to say, how many colours are can you see? So you start to open it up again. And, and it's getting that balance right. Now, I know that works, which is your what works. OK? Yeah. Don't necessarily know why it works. And I think what one of my messages from this morning is that by having these conversations with the neuroscientists and psychologists, we start to understand how and why things work, so that when we see them working, we've got more confidence that we can keep working and working that way, and we're not getting sort of semi random things. Yeah. I'm conscious of time, by the way. Okay, I will not comment on that. Other questions? It's close to four. Is there any burning questions? If not, um, I, I have a question. I have a question uh, uh, to educators. So I think that um, so I would think intuitively that a big deal in um, in the classroom is that kids are afraid of being wrong. I mean, there's implicit. I mean, there, you know, they're they're punished. You know, there's definite rewards for being right, and which means an implicit punishment for being wrong. And I wonder if uh, this is something like it could be implemented, which is to just say, I'm going to reward you for being wrong. Like if you have a kid, so if you have a kid who knows everything and gets everything right, can you push that kid and say, well, you know what, I'm not that happy. You're not pushing yourself. You need to give me an answer that will be wrong. Um, right? Because yeah. I think. Right. They, 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 so this, the bigger idea, I mean, going back to neuroscience, uh, the bigger idea for, uh, it would be that contextual variables and things like, you know, fear will totally inhibit any sort of novelty seeking or exploration. The fear of the teachers, actually. The, the, the fear the of it. Of, of yeah.
teachers to take the risk of waiting, allowing a long time for processing, coming in with scaffolding as and when. So this is our big problem with education. And as you said, if we can find the proof to support, we can then push what we actually believe in. You, you could argue, argue quite strongly that you're not learning unless you're making mistakes. So it's not a case of being wrong, because I think if you tell a child they're wrong, and you do that two or three times, they're going to say, I'm no good. Right? But if you actually can get the right language, where you actually say, well, look, we're learning, we're making mistakes, so what would happen now? Then you're starting to learn. So if you tell me about classification of plants or animals, and I know what that a fish and a dolphin are different, I've learned nothing. If I don't know that to begin with, and then I do find out because of the way it's been worked, then I've learned something. I've made mistakes of the dolphin with a fish and all of that business. Then I've made, you know, I've started to learn. I, I just want to make a comment that uh, teaching and learning are two sides of the same coin. And effective questioning is really foundational to good learning. Um, I, the, the whole, the whole, the whole, uh, as, uh, the whole idea of my coming to this, 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 this seminar is really to say, how can I be a reflective teacher? Uh, why do I say what I say? And why do I do what I do? I think that's where, where, where I think Derek Bell was trying to say, the, 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 the rationale, the why, all right? So if you look at the uh, effective teaching from Professor Lee Schumann's work, Pedagogical Content Knowledge, he uses the uh, 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 learner and learning. I think the good teaching starts from where the learner is. And then where are you going? There is the uh, curriculum, the what? This is the who. And how do you get there? There is the pedagogy, which is, has been informed right, by educational psychology. And along the way, uh, is the learner with you. There is the assessment for learning. But having said that, I think the role of the teacher is really to create a very safe learning environment where the, the, the student is able to ask any questions because the best teacher is one not just being very clear of the subject matter knowledge, but also making the, the, the teacher's thinking visible to the students. But the highest level of teaching is how do you make the thinking of the students visible to themselves? And that's where I thought educational psychology, education, neuroscience has a big role to play. So I thought just to add some uh, point of view. Thank you. would like to mention to you that there was an article in 2006 in Education Psychologist written by Kirshner and I think Clark and a third author that dealt with the question whether discovery learning and minimal guidance works for students or not and when. And the argument, was, the argument that these people made this incredibly influential article was that the human cognitive architecture is such that minimal guidance does not work in complex learning uh, situations. And I would just say that if you are interested in this whole question, whether you ask questions and leave the students discover all the learning, or how much you should guide this article may be of importance to you.